Welcome everyone to this live Q&A with Dr. Yael Jaffe, who's joining us from beautiful South Africa. Thanks for taking the time to be here with us at IFN Academy. Dr. Jaffe teaches two modules on nutrigenomics and nutrigenetic testing for us in track three. She has 20 years of experience in nutrigenomics and nutrigenomic education for practitioners and in genetic test development. She has co-authored two books, It's Not Just Your Genes and Genes to Plate, and has been published in multiple peer-reviewed scientific journals. Dr. Jaffe is an adjunct professor teaching nutrigenomics at Rutgers University and Maryland University of Integrative Health. Currently, Dr. Jaffe is the Chief Scientific Officer and co-founder of 3x4 Genetics, which launched here in the U.S. at the beginning of 2020. So just a few quick housekeeping details and we'll get started in a sec. Please go ahead and type your questions for Dr. Jaffe in the chat box. We will have about one hour for this Q&A. It will be recorded so you can access it at your leisure. Everyone who registered will receive a link to the recording. So let's get started with the first question that came in. Welcome, Dr. Jaffe, are you there? I am. Thanks, Kathy and Thank Sheila, delighted to be here. Thank you, Dr. Jaffe. Excellent. So the first question is, of course, vitamin D has been in the news quite a bit recently with the COVID pandemic. And there's some confusion or maybe misconceptions about the role of the vitamin D receptor SNP. So could you clarify for us? Absolutely. So um, the VDR gene, which is the vitamin D receptor gene, has been appearing in the nutrigenetic tests for decades now. So it's one of those that have been with me from the beginning. And there are three different gene variants that we are interested in that you will usually see in a genetic test. And there has been some confusion around these. And what has been thought in the past, or what is generally assumed, is that the presence of a SNF, a polymorphism, in the VDR gene means that the individual has a problem absorbing or metabolizing, metabolizing vitamin D. But actually the story is way more interesting than that and, and in, in many ways may more powerful. And remember that when we talk about nutrigenomics, which is kind of the broad area, we talk about nutrigenetics, which is the gene sequence change. So the gene variant or the polymorphism, something in the sequence. And we talk about nutrigenomics, which is about gene expression. What changes gene expression? Now, I bring that up because when we talk about vitamin D receptor, we're talking about a transcription factor. Now, you would have come across transcription factors in many other areas of nutrition. NF-kappa-beta is an example, NRF2, which is one of my absolute favorite. But when you get a transcription factor or nuclear transcription factor, what it does and what it's responsible is switching on other genes. So we call it like a master switch. So you switch on one switch and that switch goes on and switches on a multitude of other SNPs. And when I mean a multitude, I mean hundreds, even up to a thousand different SNPs. And we see this with NRF2 and we see it with VDR. And I don't think anyone has realized that VDR is actually a transcription factor and not just a gene with a gene variant. So what happens is we want to be able to switch on effectively a VDR transcription factor because the VDR gene or master switch is responsible for switching on anything between 100 and 1200 genes that all play a role in chronic disease. So one of the reasons we see vitamin D being so prolific in, in, in chronic disease, whether it's diabetes or arthritis or even how we see immune response to COVID, um, obesity, is because this vitamin D receptor and which is driven by vitamin D levels in the body, is able to switch on genes that impact all these different chronic diseases. So when we have a vitamin D SNP, that means that vitamin D receptor transcription factor is not switching on as effectively as we would like to. And one of the things that could make that worse is not having the right vitamin D levels in the body and therefore not having the right input of vitamin D, be it um, food, nutrient, or sun. 
So if you had two groups and one had the VDR SNP, but they both had the same vitamin D level, the one that had the vitamin D SNPs would be at a disadvantage in terms of switching on the transcription factor. But what we want to really make sure is when we see these vitamin D VDR SNPs, that our, our vitamin D levels in our body are as optimal as it can be to ensure that we're giving our, our VDR uh, transcription factor the greatest chance of being affected. D does that make sense? I hope so, because it really has been kind of almost um, ignored to a degree and not understood how powerful it really is. Absolutely, thank you so much. Yes, there's there's been a lot of um, a lot of questions about that vitamin D or uh, SNP, and thank you for the clarification about it also being a transcription factor. Uh, we also yes. have another question Very that came in. Helpful. Yeah, another question that came in that was more on the theoretical side, not so much related, Dr. Um, Jaffe, to uh, a specific SNP. But um, two questions that came in that are, like I said, a little more theoretical. The first one is, why should I bother running a detoxigenomic panel? We know that various labs have these types of panels, uh, only to tell them that they should eat more cruciferous vegetables when you can just give them that good advice without running the panel? Great question. And that question yeah. has a multitude of answers. So let me think where to begin. <laughs> so <laughs> it opens up a nutrigenomic can of worms. Okay. So the first thing, let me start off with the first thing before I get into detox specific, is that one of the problems with any company that offers either a single panel or a small list of SNPs is already problematic. Because the reality oh, wow. is that detox does not live in isolation or out of context of multiple metabolic pathways that are happening. So when we are trying to upregulate detoxification, you cannot, you cannot do it in, out of context of inflammation, oxidative stress, methylation, hormone metabolism, because of all these pathways are interacting with detoxification all the time. So that's my first comment. So I am uh, very particular about never running individual metabolic pathways or even individual um, targeted tests. So for example, a diet genetic test. So one of the problems with diet genetic tests, which brings us back to detox, is that there are a, a number of um, tests in the marketplace that look at genes that influence metabolic rate or energy expenditure or adipogenesis. They'll even go so far as to look at the wonderful appetite and satiety genes, which I love so much. But here's one of the problems, right? Is that detox is such an important part of weight management. And we know from a lot of our patients that if detox isn't optimized, weight management can be thwarted. So this right. is exactly the problem of running any one metabolic path out of context of another. So that deals with my issue around why I would never run a detox metabolic pathway. Now let's get to the second part of the question, which is, if I do look at detox and it says that I need, um, and my detox maybe isn't working as well, maybe it's GST, maybe it's um, NQ1, whatever it may be, I'm going to recommend cruciferous vegetables. Now, here's the interesting thing. You know the thing that they said smoking is really bad for you, but for some people smoking is really bad for you. So it's the same conversation with cruciferous vegetables. So we know that cruciferous vegetables are really good at upregulating detoxification and actually quite a lot of other things because of their sulforaphane potential. Right. But the reality right. is, is that we know that most Americans are actually not eating their cruciferous vegetables. And when they eat their cruciferous vegetables, they're not eating them raw. And we know that to benefit from cruciferous vegetables, which is the, the glucoraphanin, which when it interacts with myrosinase creates sulforaphane, we need to be able to eat them raw or we need to take them in an active sulforaphane supplement. So when I'm working with a patient, I want to make sure that they understand very clearly why I'm recommending cruciferous vegetables, because they have a pathway which is missing a GS, which has a DST TT1 deletion, just as an example, and perhaps a NQR1 um, um, genotype, which means it's not working effectively. 
And I know that sulforaphane is able to upregulate that pathway to be able to compensate for the genetic pathway that isn't optimized. Now, the conversation I'm having with my patient when I'm talking about GSTT1, upregulation, NQR1, in order to um, in up to your prescription factors is a very different conversation that I'm having with a patient when I go, you know, you really should eat more broccoli in your diet. It's really good for you because we know that hasn't worked. We know that as dietitians, that approach hasn't worked. Suddenly, when I'm talking about your DNA, which has your genetic variants, which is impacting your ability to detox, and I know that eating raw cruciferous vegetables can really upregulate it. It's a completely different conversation. And my last comment before we move on is there is a difference between having two to three portions or servings of cruciferous vegetables a week, which if you have suboptimal detoxification because of your gene variants is not going to be enough and eating cruciferous vegetables every day in your diet. So yes, what is the right thing? Is two to three enough for a week or is maybe two to three a day more optimal? And that information is going to be generated for you by understanding the genetic variability of your patient. So what it sounds like you're saying is that there's there's two things that I really got from that, and that is um, because of the personalized information that you're able to glean from running a comprehensive panel, so that's one concept, is that now you're able to get comp uh, personalized information. Patient, what sounds like what you're saying, Dr. Jaffe, is that patient compliance will probably be better because you have data that's specific to the patient that you're discussing, and it's not just a generic discussion about eating more vegetables. Absolutely. So we know that, I mean, obviously part of part of the conversation on root genomics is physiological and biochemical, but actually the power sits in the personalization. Because when we're hearing general dietary guidelines from the US government and saying eat more vegetables, we've been hearing that for, for well forever. And it's had absolutely no impact on people's intake. But when they're right. saying, this is you, this is not my problem. These are not my genes. And I'll tell you something else. You have these gene variants for life. They're not going away. You're not going to eat some vegetables and suddenly you, you can bring back your GST. So we find that that behavioral change, that behavioral, that ownership, accountability is that much more powerful when we know what our genetic right. variants are. Right, excellent, excellent point. And on that note, how would you deal with a situation? Because you mentioned something very interesting and I'm not sure if our listeners, um, you know, how aware uh, they are of the fact that some of these genes are not just, uh, they're not, they could be a, an insertion or deletion. So my understanding is if you have a deletion for like a GST of, uh, or some type of glutathione gene, that, that means it's not even there. There's nothing to upregulate in a situation like that. Is that accurate? Yes, that's accurate. So, so just to make sure we're all on the same page. So when we look at nutrigenetics, we look at genetic variability, and that is changes in our DNA sequence. Now, we know that, that there is going to be if like one out of every thousand nucleotides in your DNA will have what we call a polymorphism or a small change. So that makes like, that makes like three to four million changes in your DNA. Of those, we right. know that most of them actually are what we call silent variations. So they don't really do anything. We're not really interested. So we're interested in what are the genetic variants that actually change something? And often it's just a, a nucleotide change, a G to an A or a, a C to a G. And, it, and in doing that, it changes the amino acid, it changes the protein, it changes the enzyme, and it changes the biochemistry. Now, the interesting thing are deletions, because what happens in a deletion is it still has a change, but the change is so powerful, it deletes the gene. So in the case of GSTT1, what we actually land up with is a deletion of the GSTT1 gene, exactly like you said, Sheila. So now we were like, how do we upregulate something if actually the enzyme has been knocked out completely? Well, the good news with the glutathione genes, the GST genes, which are the glutathione S transferases, is that they're a family. We call it like a super family of genes. And right. the super family of GSTs, there's a P1 and a M1 and a TO1 and a TA1. There's, there's a whole bunch of them are a super family that are responsible for a lot of the functions of phase two detoxification. And they all have slightly different roles in phase two. 
And we have been able to show that if you upregulate phase two detoxification and you're able to upregulate the other GST genes, in the phase two detox, you can compensate for the deletion that occurred in your genetic results. Excellent, excellent. So that kind of leads into the second question that's similar, but just if, um, and I think you, for the most part, answered the question that came in. The, some of these questions came in ahead of time. We say that genetic relationships, whoops, hang on, sorry, my screen. Oops. Excuse me. Can I, can I just say on that topic, um, a question came in that's very specific to this, Dr. Jaffe, and um, a couple things. One is, what about fermented um, cruci crucifer vegetables? Um, are they still beneficial? And also, um, is there a case for um, dietary supplements uh, providing um, some of these uh, you know, based on broccoli sprouts and things like that. So any comments on those two items? So no, no one ever likes the answers I have for this. So I, my um, co-author on my okay. show is uh, Dr. Christine uh, Horton. And Christine is probably one of the global experts on sulforaphane. It's not me, but I've been well-trained by her. And in fact, her, mm -hmm. her PhD is entirely on sulforaphane. So we talk about this a lot. And I keep on saying to her, but if I just steam it a little bit, if I just pickle it and make a little bit, you know, surely if I just do that, um, I could, I'm still going to benefit. And the reality is, is that you can get away with very little with cruciferous vegetables. So if it's like a mild pickle um, with a little bit of a brine, then you can probably get that away. But once we start really brining that cruciferous vegetable, you're going to the 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 ph balance of that vegetable is going to change which is going to potentially destroy your myrosinase enzyme so it, it's okay. really you know people think that if i just steam my veggies that's okay but the reality is it's actually not so if you're not eating them raw and you're chewing them remember we want to chew them because it's the chewing that breaks down the that creates myrosinase to act on the glucoraphanin which creates a sulforaphane we're also not getting the benefits. So what I find is that there are many patients where I am not going to achieve what I want to achieve with raw cruciferous vegetables. They're quite tricky and they're difficult and they take a lot of work to eat. Um, so if I get like one raw portion in a day, I'm usually quite happy. So I have for a very long time been using um, uh, what I call a nutrigenomic supplement. And the reason I call it a nutrigenomic supplement is, is I'm using a supplement not to fill a hole or to plug a hole, but to activate a gene, or in this case, a transcription factor in RF2, as well as the GST genes, and upregulate them. The trick with supplements in this space is there are supplements and there are supplements. And because it's so popular, many companies have jumped on the sulforaphane bandwagon, and you'll see things like glucoraphanin extract, uh, um, if you actually see something called sulforaphane, it's probably not true because sulforaphane is only created when myrosinase acts on glucoraphanin. So we are looking for what we call active sulforaphane supplements, which have myrosinase present. And there are some companies that do a great job and there are many companies that do a terrible job. But I work a lot with this active sulforaphane supplement which has been proven to be extremely powerful in terms, well, in terms of many things, but in step, especially in terms of in RF2. I hope that answers the question. Thank yes, you. Yes, very you. helpful. Very helpful. Yeah. And um, can you give um, the name of the, the, the brand of the supplement? I'm sure some of our listeners are going to want to know if <laughs> happy to and don't have a financial interest in it. So the mm -hmm. supplement I have using for five six years now which i regard as being um the gold standard is made by cell logic c-e-l-l -L, okay. and then l-o-g-i-c it is available in the u.s you will um i've forgotten the name of the company that distributes it but if you do a google search and just put cell logic sulforaphane usa you will you will find them and they definitely distribute to practitioners in the u.s and We've been using pretty much the only supplement that's used in South Africa. And, and I just want to say one thing that often what happens with supplements, whether it's vitamin C or vitamin E, is the the molecule gets extracted from a food. So we all made in the laboratory. 
But this sulforaphane supplement that I'm talking about is actually just broccoli sprout powder. So it's grown in a couple of places around the world, which has the highest yield of glucoraphanin and marasonase. And it's ground into a powder and put into a capsule. So you're not actually taking a extracted molecule from a food. You're actually just having broccoli sprouts in a, in a capsule, which by me is, is, is a whole winner. Okay, great. And just one more, and then I'm going to turn it over to Sheila for the next question. But one more came in on the same topic. And this has been out there. I've, I've um, read it myself. What about using mustard seed with cooked crucifers? Does that make a difference? No, I don't know why. I'm not mm -hmm. sure. I'm, I might be missing something. So mustard seed itself so there are a couple of foods that have been shown to upregulate nerve 2 and RF2 and um, the GSTs. But when you look at the research and you see what the impact of those different foods, um, they're so negligible compared to a raw cruciferous vegetable or a broccoli sprout powder. Adding something to a cooked cruciferous vegetable will not restore anything in the cooked cruciferous vegetable. So all you would have is the value of the mustard seed. And I don't think that would be nearly enough. Thank you, thank you. Very interesting topic. Sheila, over to you. Yes, thank you, Dr. Jaffe. I was gonna say that um, I had followed the work of Dr. Elizabeth Jeffries. She's a PhD whose work solely revolves around broccoli and cruciferous vegetables. And um, she published a paper, oh, I don't know, I think back in 2008, where she actually studied um, you know, the effect of heat and on, on the vegetables. And I remember her basically concluding something very similar. And I think she said, and I remember her uh, presenting on this and talked about how really no more than uh, a minute of steamed heat yeah. was acceptable. And that by by about 60 seconds, the my, my, uh, myronase uh, enzyme, I'm not saying that correctly. Um, <laughs> myronase yeah. enzyme starts to, um, degrade and denature. And uh, so I, I'm sure your colleague, Christine, is familiar with Elizabeth Jeffrey's yeah, work. I, I know her work, yeah. And that's absolutely right. And the reality is no one steams for 60 seconds. So, right. um, I mean, it's very hard to steam something and get any benefit out of it. But if you can, and you can stop before 60 seconds, it's definitely worth a try. Uh, I have another question that um, I want to make sure I get out there that's um, a little different from what we've discussed. Uh, the question basically starts by saying that we say that genetic relationships to chronic disease are not monogenetic, we meant, meaning they don't tie to just one gene, and you were just discussing this, uh, that genes don't express themselves one at a time, they express themselves in families, uh, yet many people have only the MTHFR run. And there are all sorts of associations are made just from that one gene. And I know because, you know, it's an easy gene to run through uh, American labs like Quest and LabCorp. So are you saying that running something like just MTHFR then uh, without running, say, a full methylation panel is useless? Okay, that is, that is a great question. Another question that opens up about five things for me. So I'm going to start... <laughs> You're going to have to cut me off at a certain point because I could just carry on for 40 minutes. So I'm going to start with the first thing. So the concept of monogenic versus polygenic. So actually, um, a monogenic gene variant can cause a disease. And in fact, there are many monogenic um, variants that do cause a disease. So when we look at BRCA and breast cancer, that is monogenic. monogenic. A single gene variant, it's still just one letter change on a gene, but it's so powerful, it's such a high penetrance, it can cause a disease like breast cancer. Another example is FH, familial hypercholesterolemia, a single gene variant, it's just a SNP, but by itself can cause a severe atherosclerosis. So Dr. Jeff, you're not that. just talking about it, you're not just talking about an amino acid swap, you're talking about just a gene. Just, just a nuclear Yeah. Just a nuclear okay. cell change. So, so just a single nucleotide change, one of the billions that are in our body, changes the amino acid and the protein in such a significant way that it can cause a disease. And so BRCA, we know that if you have that SNP, 
your chances of going on to get um, breast cancer, you know, will be between the 60 and 80 percent. Now, that's pretty that's pretty powerful. That is not nutrigenomics, but monogenic is and, and familiar high cholesterolemia is the same. And there's a whole lot of others. And in fact, when we started learning about nutrigenomics, we actually learned about it because we started off with monogenic diseases. So another example is weight. We know that the leptin gene, if it is severely impacted with, a, with what we call one of the high penetrance gene variants, can cause obesity that is um, got nothing to do with what we eat or how we exercise or our behavior in any way. So the genetics, what is extremely powerful and the environmental impact, the diet, lifestyle, stress is not at all. But we also know that the leptin gene has other gene variants that are what we call low penetrance, the LEPR gene, leptin receptor gene, that interact with our diet, our lifestyle, our stress, our exercise, and that does have an interaction. So genetics started off with monogenic, where a gene variant could cause a disease, and then started discovering, because they're so rare, remember, so I should say that, that monogenic diseases are very rare, but polygenic diseases are not. So what is polygenic? Polygenic is when there's a, a grouping of single nucleotide um, polymorphisms, of SNPs, that when they come together, they aggregate their very small risk, and suddenly we see an outcome. The other thing about polygenic is that not only do you need a whole group of them, but they interact with their environment. They interact with what we eat, how we sleep, our stress, our environment, toxic load, and all of that. So the world we live in as practitioners, unless we work in a very medical, very genetic counseling environment, is polygenic low penetrance, in other words, the gene variant by itself can't cause a disease, and all the gene variants we are interested in interact with our diet and our lifestyle. That's my first comment. Now to get on to something that I really love talking about, which is this concept of a single SNP treatment. So we're not talking about monogenic, we're talking about polygenic. And the 300 plus nutrigenomic companies that are available to you in the US produce a genetic report that has a bunch of SNPs in it with a genotype, a GA or a CT or a TT, and they will tell you, if you have this gene variant, you must eat this or do this or take the supplement. And this is the MTHFR conversation. MTHFR has done more damage to nutrigenomics as a field of science than any other SNP. And the reason being that an entire industry was built on this idea that if you have the MTH file SNP, and I've heard things like defect, mutation, yeah. infant, yes. right? Then oh, yeah. that variation is responsible for pretty much every disease that you've ever come across in your life, right? From autism and bipolar to miscarriage, yeah. chronic disease, cancer, you name it. But, but actually, the, especially yeah. when a person has yeah. vagus for, for the SNP. Uh, uh, it's I'll just add too that I have had patients literally say to me, I have been diagnosed with MTHFR. Mm. <laughs> like it is a diagnosis. So please continue. Sorry. Yeah. So the whole thing about, about MTHFR, and it doesn't matter if it's MTHR or any other, I'm using MTHR because it's 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 the bad boy, is that uh -huh. it's just single nutrient, a single nucleotide change. What it does is it changes the activity of the MTHFR um, enzyme. That's absolutely valid. But the reality is, is that methylation actually has three pathways. And in those three pathways are a multitude of SNPs, of genes. And in those genes are a multitude of SNPs. And what we really want to understand is not what MTHFR says individually, but what else is happening in the environment of MTHFR in the kind of ecosystem of methylation and understand what is the total impact of, of, of all those genetic SNPs on methylation. So what has happened is a, a large part because of uh, supplement companies is we built this concept of SNP-based recommendations or SNP-based treatments. And one of the things that you will find a lot in the industry is companies that sell genetic tests to sell supplements. And I'm sure each of you who are listening go, oh, I know what you're talking about. And I'm not going to mention names here because there's so many of them. But all of you would have encountered a company who will sell you a genetic test. And in the results, they'll say, 
take 800 micrograms of methylated folate, take this of methylated B12, take this. They are used, and in fact, they often have the cheapest genetic tests because they don't need to make money off the genetic tests because they're making money off the supplement sale. So whenever you see a company that is selling a supplement linked to genetic tests, you must have a big red flag that you're going to fly in the air. Okay. The other thing is no single SNP can generate a dietary recommendation. They are just not powerful enough. Remember, I'm talking about polygenic. I'm not talking about things like galactosemia and PK, PKU, not those things. Um, those are monogenic. I'm talking about these polygenic chronic disease, um, it, which is most of our work. A single SNP is not that powerful. When you put them together, they start telling a story. And because of this, I've been building for the last four years or so, this concept of pathway-based analysis, that there is this methodology in the science called genetic risk score. And what it says is, mm -hmm. if there's a group of steps that are all working together in the same pathway, be it methylation, be it detoxification, be it histamine tolerance, be it choline metabolism, group all the SNPs together and weight them. Now, the, the genetic risk score methodology is very well validated in the literature because they've been using it for things like diabetes, obesity, heart disease. So they're saying, here's a group of 20 or 30 SNPs. And if you have this score, your risk for obesity is higher. So this methodology is very well regarded, but what it's never been done is taken upstream. So they've only been using the genetic risk score as a downstream evaluation for, diet, for a disease condition. And I'm saying, actually, that's not where we want to be, right? We want to know what's happening upstream. We want to know what's happening in methylation and oxidative stress and detoxification and lipid metabolism. So what if we use a validated methodology, which is assigning a score to individual SNPs, aggregating the score and then seeing whether that individual has a susceptibility to suboptimal process of the pathway. I hope that makes sense. Quite a mouthful. Now we're, now we're using SNPs in a very responsible and credible way there because the biggest problem with SNPs up until now, and I was part of the problem for at least 10 years of my career, was that a single SNP by itself cannot generate a recommendation for a diet recommendation, lifestyle, and definitely not for a supplement. All right, so you're saying including, if your patient came in and was homozygous for MTHFR, and had a plethora of symptoms, you would not recommend something as simple as a B-complex based on that alone? Gosh, no, for a couple of reasons. First of all, what else is happening? So sometimes, if here's a perfect example. You know, I'm sure you might have come across the MSOD, SOD2, manganese, superoxide, dismutase. Of this course. is a gene, all these genes like MT that are part of actually a pathway. So we know we've got MSOD, we've got catalase, and we've got GPX, three SNPs, three genes. And each one converts a superoxide to the next form, the next form, the next form. You might only test MSOD and say, well, actually, my MSOD is really um, working fine, so I don't have an issue with oxidative stress. But actually, what happened is your catalase might not be working fine, or your GPX, and you might get a block, a block there. So what we do with nutrigenomics is if we look at it through biochemical pathways, we're able to see where's the blockage. It's the same with, with like um, hormone detoxification. If we know that we're not being able to metabolize uh, hormones, estrogen, where exactly is that happening? And if we look at uh, multiple genes in the pathways, we might be able to see, ah, it's happening at the GST, it's happening at, it's happening at COMT, it's happening at NK1. Now, the problem with MTHFR, and this is one of the biggest problems, is what is happening in the world around MTHFR, MTR, MTRR, CBS? And the other thing right. is, we have been um, uh, um, lucky enough to have methylated B vitamin supplements for a very long time. And what mm -hmm. happened in the beginning, mm -hmm. more than 10 years ago, is we used to, when we saw an MTHFR variant, we used to really up the, the folic acid. Now we're lucky enough that we don't need to use folic acid, we're using methylated folate. But actually what happens with methylated folate is it bypasses MTHFR completely. So whether or not you have a TT homozygote actually doesn't matter because you're not using the MTHFR enzyme to metabolize the folic acid, you're going around the corner. So what one of the most dangerous things I've been seeing is very high supplementation of methylated B vitamins, 
mm-hmm. which are generating mm-hmm. their own set of side effects. So, so people were saying, oh, I've got MTHFR and MTHFR is causing these side effects. They were then over-methylating with these very high levels of B vitamins, methylated B vitamins, which, which were bypassing the variant anyway. And we were generating a whole lot of side effects. And the side effects of these over-methylation often mimic the under-methylation, whether it's insomnia, anxiety, restlessness. And so we actually just generated a really big mess. And, well, and I, I thank you, thank you so much. I mean, this was <laughs> your explanation was loaded with very, very important um, clinical pearls, especially the snow single snip can generate a specific dietary recommendation or lifestyle. I want to make sure that we're um, covering all the questions that keep coming in. And on the same topic uh, of methylation, um, methylated vitamins, Dr. Jaffe, someone is asking if someone has the COMP SNP, the COMT, is it more difficult for them to use methylated vitamins? They were told this by a functional medicine physician. And then there's also a question about um, folate that I'll ask after that, okay? So the question of comp again is difficult because it's out of context. So the interesting thing about comp is I don't the reason I would use methylated B vitamins when I have a comp genotype is not because methylated B vitamins impact comp in any way, because they actually don't. So there there was a time when people thought if I if I have a comp genotype, because remember when you have a comp A, a G A or AA you have a decreased activity of COMT. And we know that COMT is, I call it like the Swiss army knife of genes, that it impacts so many different biochemical processes. And, and people thought that if they supplemented with methylated B vitamins, they could upregulate COMT. But actually there's very little that upregulates COMT. And the only reason we give B vitamins is to support the methylation, because, because COMT is a methyltransferase gene, we want to make sure that the whole methylation environment is supported. And even then, before I make that decision, I want to see, okay, I know I've got a comp genotype that is suboptimal. What is going on in the rest of my methylation world? Because if my methylation ecosystem is really kicking ass and is really suboptimal and doing fantastically well, I might not supplement and I might look only at diet. So I don't even know if I'll, sorry, I answered the question. I can't even remember what the question is, but it didn't feel right to me. There was something, sorry. I got carried away and I forgot what the exact question was, but it, does, it didn't feel like it Yes, I think you answered it. It was basically, is it more difficult if someone has the comp SNP to use methylated vitamins because that's what they've been told? So I don't understand, sorry, okay, in that case, I don't understand why, because actually methylated vitamins should not be impacted by comp or interact with comp. They really mm-hmm. interact with the supporting environment that compensates for comps inactivity. Well, and also some of these um, some of these molecules have been hydroxylated. There's been because there have been some reports of people experiencing over methylation, i.e., anxiety uh, from the from the methylated B vitamins. Um, you now see some of the B vitamins uh, in their hydroxylated form as an alternative which, um, you know, I'm not sure if that has its own set of issues, but I think the key is whatever you're going to recommend in terms of supplementation, we're going to, we're going to not want to uh, overdose anybody on any of these methylated, methylating nutrients. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. Right. I mean, I generally don't, I don't, uh, I I never go over 800 micrograms of methylated folate. There's hardly right. ever a reason, unless, unless it's a pregnancy with a miscarriage, with a, like there has to be a very specific reason. Um, I usually work between the 400 and 800 range, and I personally don't, don't normally go over that. Okay. Sheila, gotcha. right, you want to? Yep. Um, so, uh, so we have a question about um, cytochrome P450 genes, but we kind of covered the detox genes. Um, I guess somebody was asking if it was good to use inducers, inhibitors. Um, not sure how using an inducer and inhibitor, you know, how that would apply to a SNP for a cytochrome P450. But um, 
you know, if you have a panel of, of where where you're looking at a variety of cytochrome P450, surely that's got to give you some some fairly good information. Yeah, I can make a comment on that. So the the interesting thing about the the SIP genes is that they're they're actually harder to influence than phase two. Um, and 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 we never ever ever look at this um, phase one genes, which are all SIPs out of context of phase two. And why? Right. the reason I say that, what I actually want to understand is I want to understand, say we're talking about hormone metabolism, right? I want to understand, is my phase one working faster than average? In other words, am I activating my, my, my hormone metabol my hormone molecules quicker than the average because remember once once a with a molecule is activated it becomes more dangerous and more potentially to uh, oxidative and toxic to the the dna environment or am i from a sub point of view actually being slower in activating my molecules in phase one so i want to understand that from my genes then i want to understand what's happening in my phase two am i actually being a very a uh, slow phase two detoxify. In other words, I might have GST and Q1, and I'm really inefficient in being able to conjugate and excrete and get rid of my phase two metabolites. Or actually, am I really efficient in phase two? So the thing right. we always teach is you need to understand both to be able to understand what you're working with. Because if you've got a fast phase one and a fast phase two, well, that's okay because whatever you're activating in phase one, your phase two will be able to clear from the body. But if you have a fast phase one and a slow phase two, then you then what you want to do is you really want to activate phase two. You want to upregulate the genes in phase two to make sure that you can get all those activated toxins. Also, it's easier to, and I use the word manipulate, it's easier to switch on and switch off phase two than phase one. SIP genes are actually really tricky to, to manipulate. They're much more pharmaceutical in their nature and they don't respond to nutrition as powerfully as our phase two. They are yes. something them and supporting which is conversations. So what I generally do is focus on on phase, understand phase one, but focus on phase two. Excellent. I'm so glad you mentioned that. That that's a big one for me personally. Thank you, Kathy. Do you want to take the next question? Yeah. No, I would agree. That was a that was a really really um, another you know important clinical pearl. Um, there's still quite a few questions on the whole um, sulforaphane. Um, and somebody's asking, do you think making this broccoli sprout drink with lemon zest and lemon juice and salt? Uh, someone also mentioned that they um, an Insta pot was validated for uh, maintaining um, the the compound. So I don't know if you have what any. Uh, I can comment on the juice. I can't. I don't know what an Instapot is. The moment you um, macerate or break down the glucoraphanin and the um, um, and the maracinase. In other words, you take a bunch of broccoli sprouts which you grew yourself organically, beautiful, and you put them into a, a blender. You add your lemon zest and whatever you add. Fantastic you basically have 30 seconds to drink it once you've made it. So, so that, that is the most important thing, is that if you're going to do that, and that's of course fantastic if you can do that, make sure that you drink it straight away. Um, I know that the sulforaphane can become a bottomless um, hole, so I hope that was helpful, but I think um, are the end, um, we must be careful, because I can talk about sulforaphane for hours, but I'm sure there's some other questions we need to, to get to. Yeah, there's a couple on skin. Do you want to mention those, Sheila? Sure, it goes back to folate. I've had some patients develop skin issues, like rashes and blisters, either on the scalp or body after taking active forms of folate. So I'm, I'm sure they're talking about methylated folic acid. Has anyone, she says, has anyone else experienced this? And if so, why is this happening? Uh, I don't know many things about them, you know, we, we, got, we don't know the patient, we don't know the genotype, so what is the genetic variations we're working with, and we also don't know the quantity of methylated B vitamins that we're given. Right. Right. I would look at all those things because 
what we're seeing in the literature is an extraordinary amount of um, side effects that happen at high doses of methylated B vitamins. Um, so I don't know what the dose was, but I would go back to zero. I would obviously see what their genes are to see what you have to work with. I would look at their diet, but but really there's no there's no supplement that doesn't do anything. Every supplement we take, it doesn't come out in our urine if, and, and it doesn't get used. It changes gene expression. It switches on and switches off genes. And it, it's like a dimmer switch on a light that if we switch that dimmer switch up too much, we can flood the system in a sense. We can impact the signaling of those genes, which was actually very nuanced and very complex. So I would just say, go back to some basics there. I don't know how much was given, but, and it's the same, uh, let me just say. Mentioned, um, Dr. Jaffe, 400 to 800 micrograms. Yeah. So that's not so high, but I also don't know what the gene variants were. So I would go back to food and just take it out and also just have it, you know, let's understand what the gene variants are that you're working with. Um, and the other thing is, um, just a quick note, so I don't, um, um, I'm not remiss. Sulforaphane is a potent activator of phase two detoxification and, um, and NRF2. And there are some people, especially those who are poor detoxifiers, that if you give too much sulforaphane too soon, they will have mm -hmm. side effects from the detox. In the same way that when you're doing like a medical detox, you always start slowly, very gently. Sulforaphane is exactly the same. So please, if you have a patient, I always start patients off from sulforaphane very, very, very slowly. Um, and then build them up. Because it's like anything you do with medical detox. You don't want to go in there and, and kind of, um, hit the system. So I just wanted to add that I didn't mention it. Okay, well, so I'm, I'm really sorry. glad you mentioned that because um, I really think that if you're going to detoxify your patient, you want to make sure that you're supporting elimination. You're going to detoxify them. They, they, they need to be able to eliminate. So that's another thing to keep in mind and an, another great example of the interrelationship of the various systems. And of course, gut. Of course. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> okay. And okay. I know we've got, you know, a few minutes left and some people are asking Dr. Jaffe a couple of things. Um, one about your company, which we hope you'll share uh, more with us, but also about your um, course and is there a discount for IFNA students? So <laughs> if, if you want to <laughs> mention something about, about your course, which is, I will say, incredible. Um, course and also about your company. I, um, Kathy, so they, before, Dr. Jaffe, before Dr. Jaffe, you jump in there, let me just mention and let everyone know that Dr. Jaffe um, is a preferred provider with IFNA, and so our IFNCP grads, um, you know, any any CEUs that they earn uh, from Dr. Jaffe's program is applied to the credential that you earn with IFNA, which is the IFNCP. Just want to re re remind everybody about that. Thank you, Brilliant. Sheila. Yes. Thank Wonderful. Sheila, yeah. It's also got CEUs for um, the Academy and also for ACN, just in case I forget. So okay. when I talk about my company, and I talk about my course. They actually feel like the same conversation because for many, many years, I was only focused on, um, I, I left the genetic testing world with great disillusionment and I focused only on education for about four years. And so I built two courses. Um, I had a very, very, very long course, which is now we, we've suspended for a while because it was more like a master's. But we have um, a foundations and nutrigenomics course, which is one that Kathy has done. And basically what it, what it does is it really gives you the basics that you need um, in terms of nutrigenetics and nutrigenomics. So one of the problems we have in the marketplace is that most training courses focus only on gene variants, SNPs, and the recommendations. And we believe that gene variants is 50% of the conversation, but using nutrition to change gene expression is actually where the magic happens. And that's really where, as practitioners and dietitians, that's where our power sits. How do we use foods, um, bioactive supplements to, to change gene expression? And the body is allowed to heal itself. Um, so the the course is is called Foundations in Nutrigenomics. Um, if I don't have a discount, for, if I will make sure I have one within an hour. Absolutely, we we <laughs> took it up and done. I'm sorry that I haven't done that yet. If I haven't, 
Um, but just to mention about 3x4, so the company that, so I have been involved in many companies, um, and as I say, left genetic testing for some time, I decided to come back into the world when I really realized that so much of what I'd done was really not good enough, and that was this idea of single SNPs. And so I have um, built um, a completely different test. test um, it's called 3x4 Genetics, and it's built on this pathway-based analysis concept. So I know we don't have much time, so very quickly, um, there is no diet test, there is no health test, there is no sport test. There's, there is one test that has um, 24 different biochemical pathways in. Each pathway is a grouping of gene variants which have been scored in a genetic risk score, and we create an impact. Um, the report is um, based on color for visual uh, languaging to work with your patients, and it's also got something called a visual conversation where we build infographics to communicate with our patients and every individual patient has a different infographic because their gene results are different. Um, the other thing is we it's based very much on functional nutrition principles. We start upstream with our key cellular processes of inflammation, oxidative stress, methylation and um, detox and then we go down to a systems level, an energy level and a nutrients level. So. What I found with all the other genetic tests I've been involved with, first of all, they were SNP based, which I wanted to, to get away from. Um, and the other thing is that um, they were not, they did not tie in with functional training and functional nutrition. And I think um, this has been the most exciting opportunity. The other thing is we're practitioner only. We um, have a network of practitioners in the US that we um, nurture, educate, upskill, mentor, care deeply about. Um, Kathy is one of ours, so she can talk a little bit to that. But really, we're tr what we're trying to do is we're actually trying to upskill practitioners to become nutrigenomic experts and truly differentiate themselves in the market. And yes, we have an education course, and yes, we have a report, but we're, we call ourselves a complete solution because we're as interested in the practitioner becoming an expert in the education and then also in um, providing a report that's really meaningful and easy to use in your practice. I think that's my two minutes uh, pitch. <laughs> Thank you. Really, really helpful. We had a lot of curious um, students. Um, Sheila, any others that you have? Uh, let's take a look at this. Hang on. I, my, um, the only my, one I my, saw that I think yeah. we which I think you you did um, explain, but um, it came in again. Did I understand monogenetic disorder is um, unreversible? If so, could you give any examples? If you yes, want to just go over. This. Yeah, maybe I'll go over mm -hmm. one more time. So okay. what I'm comparing is monogenic versus polygenic. Monogenic is there is a gene with a gene variant. So it's still just a spelling change in the DNA sequence, a gene variant, okay? But it, that variant changes the protein, changes the amino acid in such a powerful way that by itself, it can cause a disease without bad eating or no exercise or a high stress environment or a toxic exposure. So there will be triggers that switch it on, but by itself, the gene is very powerful. We call it monogenic because it's a single SNP that is linked very clearly to a disease. And we call it high penetrance because it has such a strong power in causing a disease. And the examples I used are um, BRCA, BRCA1 and 2 for breast cancer. I spoke about um, FH, familial hypercholesterolemia. Um, the other one that you will be very familiar with is PKU. It's the first, I think, the first disease I ever learned about as a dietitian, where mm -hmm. we're not. Um, Phenyl ketone and urea, you actually cannot metabolize an amino acid. And that is actually just a gene variant. It's a single SNP where the body is unable to process. So that is monogenic. And it, they're very rare. They usually happen in less than 1% of the general population. And there isn't, okay, in PKU, there's a lot you can do. You can um, get the phenyl aniline out of the diet. But generally, there's not a lot you can do in terms of diet, lifestyle, intervention. Of course, in a supportive way, but not in a reversal way. The place we love, the nutrigenomic, nutrigenetic space is polygenic, many, many, many SNPs that 
in their way, change biochemistry in some way. So they change the biochemistry in some way, but they don't cause a disease. But when you put them all together and study them together in their biochemical pathways, they give you insight into how biochemically your patient might be um, functioning less optimally. And then because we love nutrigenomics, which is how do we use nutrition to change gene expression or upregulate it? We can't change the DNA sequence, but we can change the way the gene behaves itself. And so we can use diet and lifestyle to have a better outcome and, up, and, and to optimize those pathways for our patients. I, I hope that clarifies it better. It does, Dr. Jaffe, on that note, so let me make sure I'm, I'm understanding for and for everyone else as well. Are you categorizing uh, conditions that where there's a swap in, a, in an amino acid as the same as when there's a swap in just a nucleotide? Like for example, sickle cell is a, is a swap of an entire amino acid, not just a nucleotide. So are those, are those two different things when there's a a swap in a nucleotide versus an amino acid? There's always a swap in a nucleotide before you have a swap in an amino acid. So DNA determines the amino acid, which determines the protein. So sickle cell anemia is monogenic, and it's high penetrance, and it's rare. So when you have sickle cell anemia is a SNP, and when you have that SNP, it changes the amino acid, and the amino acid changes the protein, and that causes sickle cell anemia. So that is a perfect example. There's no diet or lifestyle behavior that can change the outcome of that. So that yeah. sickle cell anemia, yeah. thank you very much, is a perfect example of monogenic, high penetrance, no diet and lifestyle intervention. It's very rare, but it's just a SNP. It's just a SNP. And the SNP has changed the amino acid. And that amino acid change is so significant, it changes the cell completely into a sickle cell. I really appreciate you clarifying that because I'm not sure that it was clear that um, the, just because there was a SNP, the entire that the entire amino acid. Well, I guess that makes sense, I and mean, that that does change the entire amino acid. It is um it is now two minutes of uh to the hour to the top of the hour. Um, this I might think be a good we time. got through all the questions. <laughs> yes, yes. yes this a good time to stop. There's always many, many questions and there's never enough time. But wow, Dr. Jaffe, thank you so much for um, your time and your expertise today. Um, I really love that we were able to, uh, to dive a little deeper into two main areas, which was really methylation and detoxification, two really big areas that there's always just so many questions about. Um, we thank you for sharing with us a little bit more about your your work and um, and you know if I'm I'm going to go ahead and and we're going to have this uh, presentation. This presentation is being recorded and so the link will be sent out to anyone who registered. Um, are there any final closing remarks, Kathy? Other than that, I think we're all set. Um, Dr. Jaffe, if there are any um, any information that you could forward us that we can forward to our students about your your work in your company, that'd be great. But I think we're so all set I'm, for now. I'll just yeah, add just my, add my yeah, yeah, you go deepest gratitude. <laughs> okay, my deepest gratitude to you as teacher, mentor, um, brilliant scientist, and thank you so much for your time with us here today. Oh, and, and thank you so much to Sheila and, and Kathy. I love I love uh, IFN Academy. I love the quality of the practitioners that I get to engage with when um, I meet them and they reach out to me and I love the work you're doing. This is um, so important that we bring functional nutrition really to be its its own speciality and, and, um, and that's how we're going to change the profession of dietetics. So thank you very much for having me. And I look forward to the next time already. Thank you, Dr. Jaffe. And thank you, everyone. And we'll see you next time.